Hello and thanks for joining me for this week's video. This is actually going to be a follow up to last week's video because I had a request in the comments asking me to talk about things that heirs can do to actually prevent foreclosure from happening in the first place when their parents die. So I'm going to go ahead and try my best to put this in a short video that can explain it more clearly. So the first thing to know is that whenever somebody dies in the state of Texas, whether they have a will or not, the heirs, they step into that person's shoes. They inherit at the time of death. So they're actually the new owners um, for all intents and purposes. However, the loan is still with the deceased. So the, the loan is now essentially the obligation of the estate because the person has passed away. For that reason, the estate still owes on the mortgage if there's a mortgage tied to that property. And most of the time you do have mortgages still on people's properties when they die. So what rights do the heirs have or what obligations do they have since they are not the ones that signed for the loan? The heirs should pay the mortgage payments, of course, which somebody pointed out, because the estate is owing on the loan. The first thing that I wanted to clarify is that the inheritance in Texas, the inheritance takes place as of the time of death. So whether somebody has a will or doesn't have a will, has a trust or doesn't have a trust, the heirs are inheriting that property at the moment of death. That's the legal standpoint, from the legal standpoint. And then, so the question people have is what happens to the mortgage? And somebody even had commented that, why wouldn't the heirs just make the payments? So the heirs are able to make the mortgage payments, of course, if there's a mortgage on property that's owned by their deceased parent, and they're trying to make sure that there is not an, a foreclosure, you know, that, that takes place. They're, they have that option, however, from the legal standpoint and the legal perspective, that loan, you know, the mortgage is actually the obligation of the estate not necessarily the obligation of the heirs, but because they're going to want to maybe retain the property, keep the property, then it's wise to make the mortgage payment. So they don't have to make the mortgage payments, but they risk losing the collateral if they fail to make the mortgage payments or make some arrangement to satisfy that mortgage. So that brings me to today's video. What can the heirs actually do to prevent foreclosure in the first place so that we're not going back trying to do a reversal? I'll talk about what they can do and I'll also quickly mention um, how that factors in when the foreclosure has already taken place. The shortest way to make sure that the foreclosure doesn't take place is, of course, what we just discussed, which is to make sure that the payments are being made monthly, the mortgage payments, so that there is no default on that loan. Or to make sure that whatever default had already occurred when the parent maybe was ill or unable to take care of the mortgage while they were dying, then the heirs could step in and make those payments and catch up on the mortgage payments. That's a sure way, right, to prevent foreclosure. The next way to prevent the foreclosure is to initiate a probate proceeding. I know, I know people don't want to do probate because it sounds very expensive and time consuming and uh, a little bit complex in, in some cases. Even if the person doesn't have a will, it's actually wise to open a probate case. Why would you, would you want to do that, right? That's what people ask, like, why would you do that? and spend money to do a probate case and time and hiring lawyers. The reason you want to do that is that the law protects the heirs more when there is a probate proceeding. And specifically speaking, it, when it's a, it's a dependent administration of the estate. So you don't have to have a will to have a dependent administration of the estate or this is person does not have to have had a will for you to do a dependent administration of the estate. So what's the difference between a dependent administration and independent administration? And why am I talking about the first one? Well, the law is very clear in the state of Texas that whenever there's a dependent administration of the estate, the lenders or creditors cannot do anything at all until after a period of six months have passed or there's a court order allowing them to do a foreclosure. Okay, so that's what the dependent administration does. A dependent administration is slightly different from an independent administration in the sense that 
the court supervises things. So the person that's named as the administrator of the estate who is in charge of the affairs of the estate, usually a, ch a child of the deceased person or a sister of the deceased person, a brother of the deceased person, they will have to report to the court as they're taking different actions to sort out the estate's assets and debts. In the independent administration, they don't have to consult with the court at all. They don't have to get court's permission. All they have to do is at the end of the proceeding file, uh, proof of the inventory of assets and then get that approved by the court. So that is very different because the person is independent of court supervision, whoever that administrator is. And when that's the case, the law is not as clear. So the law in Texas doesn't quite tell us whether the creditors, you know, in this case, the mortgage company has to then wait six months to be able to do a foreclosure if it, it, the case is an independent administration. However, this Texas Estates Code, which is the one that covers what we can and cannot do when somebody dies, uh, that statute actually was changed in 2011 in some ways, and some changes affect the independent administration of the estate. There are some changes in there um, from 2011 that say that the mortgage lenders have to take certain steps before they can do a foreclosure as well. So one of the steps is also that they will have to choose or elect their claim to be called a preferred debt and lien as opposed to a matured secured lien. There's a little difference there and I'll explain in a minute. And then the other thing that the changes would require is that that particular mortgage company will then have to wait six months anyway and follow certain steps to be able to do a foreclosure. So I think both could work from the way that I'm looking at the statute, although the case law has not been very clear when it comes to the independent administration. So whenever in doubt, just make sure to talk to an estate's lawyer or real estate lawyer because they can look at the case law and pull everything up. However, for the dependent administration, it's very clear that it's always been that way. There is a long standing case law, um, which is the case of Pierce versus Stokes from 1956. And that case clearly says that the mortgage lenders cannot do anything with the collateral, which is the real estate until six months have passed from the time that the letters of administration, remember dependent administration, the letters of administration have been issued. So that one is covered. Whether independent administration is covered, it will depend on how the court interprets it, but I think that both could work because either way, you'll notify the mortgage lender and all the other creditors that you have a probate case pending. And most of them are wise enough that they don't want to be liable for any mistakes or any issues. So they usually would still wait the six months. So that's what I think is a sure way for you to be able to buy time to prevent foreclosure. And it's six months from the date that the letters of administration have been issued. So let's say you file the lawsuit, which is called the application for administration of the estate, and you will call it exactly what you would want, whether it's dependent or independent, you'll call it that. And when you file that case, the letters of administration are not issued within a week. You could maybe have the letters issued after 30 days or 60 days. So if you think about it, when you add six months to the 30 days, you really have seven months. Let's say it took two months to get to the point of the letters of administration being issued and granted, then you have eight months in that case. So I think that's the surest way for the heirs to pre prevent foreclosure. Now, if money is an issue, then the heirs would have to either work something out with a lawyer that's handling the estate or, you know, start pulling the money together from all the different heirs to be able to get the case started. Because once you get the case started, then it helps you to buy time, as I said. So what are the other things that heirs can do if they don't choose this option? Well, the other things that they can do would be to have a designated family member to approach the mortgage lender to try to do an assumption of the loan. I touched on that in the last video, and that is up to the discretion of the lender most times, unless the loan is outright 
outrightly assumable on the face of it. If you see the deed of trust and it says that it's an assumable loan, then you will have a right to assume it. Um, and the paperwork will be done. They do do a little application process. It's not as tedious as a regular application process for a loan. And then all the heirs can then assume the loan together. And hopefully that works out. If there's no assumption option or if the assumption is denied because the loan was not an assumable loan to begin with, then the heirs can also ask to try to do a refinance because you could get a loan to pay off the loan, right? Depending on how much is owed, how much is left on the loan, some credit unions might be able to step in to do a refinance. I mentioned credit unions because their rates are usually uh, better compared to the big banks. So you could try to refinance in that way. And that will be in the name of all of the heirs that are inheriting together. The other thing that the heirs could do is to try to sell and ask for time to sell because selling uh, assures you that you'll be able to pay off the uh, mortgage and then be able to split the proceeds, you know, whatever is left. All of these things that I'm talking about will really depend on whether the deceased person had a will, because if they had a will that bequeathed or gifted this particular property to only one child, then the other children could not actually do all these other things because they're not entitled to the collateral to begin with. They're not entitled to that asset. So the one child that might be inheriting, truly inheriting this property is the one that will step in to try all these different things. The best way, again, is always to go through probate in this case, because the will should be submitted to probate within four years of the parent's death, because that's the amount of time that the law gives us in Texas to bring a will to court, with very few exceptions. So that should all be done within four years of the parent's death, and then that person will get a deed of distribution which would put it in that person's name, the child that was gifted the property. Will get. And once the child that was gifted the property gets it, then that child can try to do the assumption, the refinance, everything. The reason I'm mentioning this is that the lenders are very difficult to work with unless you have some sort of legal standing that is a little bit more clear than just being a child of that person or a spouse of that person. They want to know, are you truly the person that inherited the property because sometimes just being a child is not enough or being a spouse because that person might have gifted it in their will to a third party or somebody else so the lenders like those things to be properly done and in the case where the person did not have a will i would always suggest to have an affidavit of fair sheet done first because when you have that in place that shows that a they did not have a will or at least no will was found, and that B, here are all of the children, you know, the surviving spouse, or whether they didn't have a surviving spouse, and whether they adopted children or didn't adopt children. So all of that will be laid out in the affidavit of heirship, and you should already have that recorded with the county. Then you'll submit this as proof of who would have inherited the property. That's something that's very important to the mortgage lenders. Otherwise, they don't really want to talk to people and they waste your time. So I always say, get that done if there's no will. And if there is a will, certainly go through probate because that just makes everything quicker, easier, and fairer. And it also allows the lender to be able to deal with the right party, like the executor or administrator of that estate. And they feel like they're getting the right information and dealing with the right people. So those are the things that the heirs can do. If The other thing that the heirs could do if there's a minor child involved is that they could start a process in the court, which is a request to sell property of a minor if they're going to sell the property because they do have to do that anyway. Most title companies will not close. Um, the title companies will not close on that transaction until they get an order regarding the minor's portion of the proceeds. So that is a case that would also help you to delay the foreclosure process and then you know buy more time until you can sell. But that process is only useful if you're actually going to sell the property, not if 
you're not trying to sell the property and just trying to keep it. If you're trying to keep the property, then the only options are to continue to make the mortgage payments, assume the loan, um, or do a refinance of some sort that would allow you to be able to pay off the mortgage debt. And then I said, I'll come back and explain that if the foreclosure had already happened, what can you do? If the foreclosure has already happened, I would say, depending on how long ago it happened, you should completely rush to court. If it happened recently within the last two or three months, you should rush to court and file and start that application for a dependent administration. Start that application process anyway. And the law, you know, remember the case that I mentioned, Pierce versus Stoke says that the court is allowed to reverse the mortgage foreclosure sale if you come quickly. So you can ask for a reversal of that sale and that will be reversed if you're able to come quickly to court. But that I think can only be useful if the foreclosure happened recently. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then the other question people might have is what is it that's a preferred debt and lien? What is that election? that um, the lenders make when they're in probate court. The election that they make is a way that claims are processed for creditors because sometimes people have several creditors like judgment creditors for maybe they had a credit card debt and it went to court and there was a judgment. Maybe they have an IRS lien. Uh, maybe they just have something tied to the solar panels on the house. So those are different types of creditors and this particular creditor, the mortgage company is going to be a secured creditor, yes, because they have that collateral that secures the loan. However, if they would try to um, get a priority list of creditors and how they will be paid, most creditors would prefer to be called preferred debt and lien. They'll like their claim to be called that as opposed to a matured secure, secured lien um, because the Preferred debt and lien puts them ahead of all, all the other creditors when they're being paid. It prioritizes that particular debt. However, however, that's in exchange for foregoing any sort of deficiency judgment or any sort of deficiency on the collateral. So let's say the mortgage company normally could come after somebody for the balance due if the collateral sells and there's not enough money to pay off the mortgage, for instance then they lose that opportunity to come after the estate for any deficiency. So that's what they do when they're electing to be treated as a preferred debt and lien, as opposed to a matured security, matured secured lien, as opposed to be, being treated as a matured secured lien. A matured secured lien is exactly what it says, that the mortgage has now matured, it's due, and that particular one designation does not really prioritize the mortgage company over any other creditors. It just says that theirs is due and they still would have the right to pursue a deficiency judgment. However, you know, liens are prioritized. <laughs> However, you know, all the liens are prioritized naturally, typically uh, based on how they are filed and based on the nature of the lien. A secured lien is always going to be ahead of the non-secured liens whenever the collateral is the one that's being sold to be able to get the funds. So uh, the, either one works, but that's just something that is a, an election in court whenever they want to make sure that they get ahead of everybody when the collateral sells. So they're rather be called a preferred debt and lien. And when that particular property does sell, then the mortgage will be paid first and everybody else will be paid next, right? So that's pretty much all it is. But the new laws in the statute is now saying that once they make that election, then they automatically must wait six months. Even though it's an independent administration, they still would wait six months from the time the letters of administration were issued to be able to start any foreclosure proceedings. So I think this uh, just tells us overall that the best way for heirs to be guaranteed that they can have more time is to start a probate case for an administration of the estate, um, or maybe even a probate case for uh, the will itself, if there's a will, because that would also have the same effect. They'll uh, The creditors will have to go to court and get through you know, a judge's uh, review of the case.
to be able to do a foreclosure. So either way, I think it's best to just open a probate case. That's my short answer to the question. Um, if I think of anything else that I left out, I'll definitely come back and do another video. And I hope this addresses the questions that people had about what could be done prior to the sale. Um, if you have anything else that you think I missed, make sure to put a comment below and I'll come back again and answer to those. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.